So, uh, yeah, well, Beatrice Farron Society welcomes you today to, to hear our celebrated speaker, Dan Pearson. And uh, I'm here as the president of, Be of Beatrice Farron Society. My name is Scott Kaniako. So I think you know why you're all here, but um, nevertheless, let me just read a little thing about Dan and then we will start on the lecture. And then after the, lec the lecture, there'd be the presentation of the Beatrice Farron Achievement Award. And then after that, questions uh, from the audience and from the Zoom, Zoom audience. So yeah, here we are. Dan will talk about his journey as a garden and landscape designer from childhood obsession with pond life in his parents' garden and through a burgeoning school, schoolboy interest in plants, both native and ornamental, which led to his formal education in horticulture at Wisley and the Royal Botanic Garden, Q. He will touch on a number of recent and current public projects that aim to engage and educate visitors, visitors about nature, including visionary Millennium Forest on the Japanese Garden of Haikoto and, has, and his as yet unrealized plans for the Dartington Estate in Devon, where he walks in the footsteps of our Beatrice Farron. Pearson is a British landscape designer, horticulturalist, writer, and garden, gardener whose work is characterized by innate sensitivity to place, an intuitive and light-handed sense of design, a strong ecological approach to biodiversity and bold painterly naturalistic plantings with deep rooted horticultural knowledge. He is a member of the Society of Garden Designers, an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, and, a, and the Royal Designer for Industry. In 2022, this January, I think, he was awarded an OBE in the Queen's New Year's Honors. It's a privilege to have you here, Dan, and please. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much indeed for welcoming me to your uh, beautiful island and uh, this amazing environment that I've been looking at today and getting a feel for. Um, I really wanted to talk to you about how I started out because a lot of my work really is very much about a feeling and it's about tuning into a place and working out what is right to do there, what is best to do there, and often what is the most practical thing to do there. And when you bring all those things together, you can start to tap into some magic. So if people feel like they've been transported by the environments that I'm helping to make, then I feel like I've really begun a journey that is worth exploring with the people that are in those places. So it's an incredibly exciting world. And for me, it started early. I remember very distinctly uh, this particular garden that I was brought up in with a little two up, two down house that my parents were renting at the time. Um, and I distinctly remember the feeling of the garden and shelling peas with my mum and uh, the nasturtiums and the first connections really with that wonderful world of growing things. And we moved to Hampshire and uh, the first project that I got involved with was with my dad, uh, aged about five. And we made this sort of pond, which was probably five by four and a half feet with a blue plastic liner. And we put together a list of plants from a catalog. And I looked at the list of plants in the catalog, which was basically just the numbers, you know, there was one pink water lily, one white water lily, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember obsessively sitting in bed looking at those numbers and thinking one day those plants will come and we'll get them. And sure enough, those uh, plastic bags arrived full of uh, fetid mud, which we lowered into the water, which immediately went green and everything disappeared. But I spent that summer peering over the edge of this grassy lid we'd made to the pond on the edge. And this alchemy happened and the water cleared and the water lilies reached to the surface and their foliage spanned out and they created their own little ecosystem in which other things were living and 
uh, the water uh, marginals, they speared out of the mud and, and we suddenly we had this little environment and I never forget that incredible sense of being part of something that had its own rhythm and its own evolution. We'd helped it to come to life and then it had a life of its own and that I think is the incredible alchemy of gardening and the gardening has never really left me and I really have felt very privileged to have found that early on in life and to then be able to make it into a vocation. And when we were, when I was about eight, um, a house along the road behind the big overgrown hedge that had spilled into the lane, uh, through which an old lady used to come in the autumn with windfall apples, came up for sale because the old lady called Miss Joy um, no longer came out from the hole in the hedge with the windfall apples. Um, she'd, she'd died, she'd uh, come to the end of her time there. Um, my mother, who was brought up in vicarages, ramshackle vicarages, uh, couldn't wait to get through the hole in the hedge and see what Miss Joy had been living in because all we could see was this chimney with a tree growing out of it above the hole in the hedge. And we went down, I'll never forget, into this other world, which was an acre of forgotten garden. And Miss Joy had been overwhelmed by this garden and there was a kibia vine uh, wrapped around the furniture in the house and all the, uh, the curtains had rotted up from the floor and she'd covered most of the rooms with dust sheets and underneath when the furniture was moved, uh, there were these perfect imprints of the pieces of furniture with the dust from the woodworm. Uh, she had rat's holes under every single door um, and she'd been living there like this for a long, long time. Um, Anyway, to cut a long story short, my mother fell in love with the house. She bent my dad's arm and we ended up moving there. And then spent the next sort of seven or eight years until I left home, um, clearing this garden and finding that Miss Joy had been this wonderful gardener. And she'd put this garden in at the beginning of the 1900s, uh, planted it almost from scratch. Uh, we found trilliums growing under bramble bushes. We found groves of amelanchia that we never knew were there. Um, uh, a bamboo garden, a pond, which we didn't even know existed, the remains of old borders, you know, everything underneath this uh, festooned vegetation where nature had got the upper hand. And it was an amazing place to be brought up because inside this uh, acre of land, there was a whole world that I existed in that I felt completely autonomous within. Not autonomous, I felt was all I needed. Um, but my parents gave me uh, autonomy there and um, I started to develop the garden with them. My dad was, uh, grew the flowers, he was a painter and my mum uh, uh, taught fashion. Um, and between them, we ended up doing this gentle restoration of a garden on teachers' salaries and uh, just our energies and students of dad's that would come back and help us in the summer holidays. So there was a garden of discovery really, and uh, I started growing plants and I had a wonderful neighbor called Geraldine Noyes, who was my mentor at the time. She was a naturalist and she would go off to Europe and bring plants, smuggle plants back in her car on summer journeys and then show them to me in the garden and talk to me about where they'd come from. So she'd say, this Fritillaria paranoica, I found on the pass of Sun so and so in the Alps and it was growing with this and that and the other and it was by water but so she'd bring all this to life so I started to make this connection between the way that things grew in a natural environment and how to grow them in a garden and we were always pushing the garden back in a way or pushing nature back to try and make a way into the garden um, because nature was stronger than uh, the four of us and uh, I made a long yellow border. I loved that color. Mum and dad gave me that um, opportunity to do that. I made a, a rockery or restored the rockery. Dad made the white border on one side. There was a quiet competition between the two of us. Um, we used to have wonderful long conversations about color um, along this path. Um, dad taught me a huge amount about how to look at uh, composition. Um, and this was a plan that I did to get into Wisley for the course at Wisley. I was not doing well at school. I didn't enjoy it. 
I was doing well in certain subjects and very, very badly in others because they really wanted to just be gardening. And um, so I was a very lopsided student. And at some point, mum said to me, well, why, why are you going through the process of pushing yourself through A-levels? And, um, and I said, well, because I want to go to art college, which is what I wanted to do. And she said, well, why don't you follow your heart and do horticulture? Which was a really brilliant piece of advice because uh, following your heart, if you can do that, of course, is, is uh, a way through to uh, having a joyous existence with your work. And I went to Wisley, showed them this plan that I've done of this border. And I remember them saying they couldn't believe that I'd done it because I was 17. And for me, it was the most natural thing in the world. Um, I'd studied John Brooks's books and planting plans. And, you know, I was completely obsessed. Um, and I remember them saying, well, this is, this is most unusual. Um, and for me, it was just what I was doing at the time. And, uh, but I always knew that I, didn't just want to learn how to grow plants, I wanted to learn how to put them together. So I started to look at landscape architecture courses when I'd finished Wisley and they just seemed to me to be so dry um, on the horticulture front. And I knew that somehow I'd be able to come back to the design. If I studied the horticulture, I'd be able to work anywhere with, um, with my raw materials. So I started to um, venture out into the world and did a year at the Edinburgh Botanic Gardens and started to meet friends there who were interested in going out to look at plants in the wild. And we formed a little group of people, of four of us, and we'd go out to look at the west coast of Scotland at the wild gardens there. And then we got a scholarship to go to the Picos de Europa in northern Spain, um, and this is us, the skinny boys in the car, me doing our plant collection. And just started to really make this connection through looking at the way that Geraldine had shown me the plants as a child of, uh, if you can understand, understand how something grows in the wild, then you've got so much better understanding of it in a cultivated setting, you know, what it grows with, why it was growing where it was, um, what it was flowering with, what it, wasn't flowering with what was yet to come what was had passed before it all those things are incredibly useful so I started doing a series of big travels going out to look at more and more ambitious places this was the valley of flowers in the Himalayas which completely opened my mind really to this idea of perhaps being able to garden on a grand scale um, using plants in a naturalistic way uh, so that they were used in a, in a, in a painterly fashion, um, but also in a way that was looking to use things that didn't compete with each other, but were compatible. Um, I got a scholarship after I spent three years at Kew, doing the Kew Diploma, to go to the Jerusalem Botanical Gardens and went out every single weekend to a different part of the country, setting off on the last bat bus before Shabbat hit and then Shabbat would kick in and the buses would stop running and I'd be stranded on the Sea of Galilee or up in the Golan Heights or right down uh, on the Egyptian border. And then I would just look at what was growing there and through looking at the environment as it came to life after a wet winter, I started to learn how to read how plants move through landscape, how they um, find their niche. Um, so these are just a couple of images really from that time when I was there and also looking at how things naturally compose themselves. So the, the alliums and the Onchocerus iris is on the right, you know, just the compositions that you find in nature are so pleasing, so easy, so they make you feel so good, they're not forced. Um, and I'd been given my first commission, just backtracking a little bit, when I was at Wisley uh, by a friend called Francis Mossman. Um, and I say she's a friend now because she's my oldest client. I don't work with her anymore, but we've become very close friends. And Frances was teaching fashion with my mother and uh, had got a garden. It was her first garden. She was in her early 30s at the time. And she said, I just want to move faster. I don't want to be making the mistakes I'm making. And mum said, well, I think you should meet Dan. So the two of us met and I did her first garden for her in London. And uh, then she moved on and bought this property called Home Farm uh, with the view to, she's a kind of visionary person really, she said I want a garden without boundaries, I don't want to feel like 
there are any boundaries. I want there to be this blur between the garden and the landscape beyond. And, and I said, well, these are exactly the things that I've been thinking about when I've been looking at these natural landscapes overseas. And so she said, okay, well, let's, let's make a garden. Um, so in Four Acres, we started to experiment and over 14 years, I went up every single month for three days while I was setting up my very small garden design business and uh, helped her to develop this garden. And um, we worked around in a clockwise fashion from the back of the house. Um, this is me in the early days where the house was being restored. Um, I was working from the back of my yellow van um, with the tools I had in the back and, uh, and all this will to do, do stuff. Um, and over the course of 14 years, we made a number of gardens around the house that started to uh, work with the environments that were very different at the back, for instance, with the wood that influenced the northern facade of the building, um, and then uh, using things in this naturalistic fashion uh, as if the plants had been sown in the garden and not planted. Um, they'd found their own way with mother colonies and satellite groups that had burst away and broken from them and just starting to experiment with this idea and in tandem, meanwhile, um, in Europe, uh, I, I didn't know it, but there were people like Pete that were doing the same things. And um, when that, um, it, when it became clear and those things sort of came up through Gardens Illustrated that actually I was part of this zeitgeist, it was an incredibly exciting thing. And of course, this zeitgeist has been running for much uh, longer than that. It's gone back to William Robinson and Carl Furster in, in Germany, you know, they're working way back. And of course, Beatrix Farron was part of that. Here was that interest in naturalism um, that juxtaposed with the more formal aspects of horticulture. And um, it was just incredibly exciting to feel that uh, there was this, this wave that was gathering speed that was entirely good because it was about somehow reconnecting with nature. And that has been a very, very exciting thing to be part of. And Home Farm was this first opportunity to start working at scale. And this is the barn garden, which was our almost penultimate project there before the garden was sold um, in 2000. Um, but before it was, we made um, a garden there, which was called the barn garden or the hot garden. And I was playing with color using color around the site in very different ways. Um, in a way that Gertrude Jekyll might have uh, used her color wheel. Um, I was making these color fields, which I've used as a theme throughout my work to heighten moods, create atmospheres, um, tune into a sense of place, tune it up, tune it down. Um, and this garden was very exciting for me because it was the first time that I'd made one whole garden rather than working on separate parts. It was going back to that conversation my dad said with me when I was learning to paint and he said, just remember to always look at the whole canvas. Don't find you're working in one corner. Always just keep on working the whole thing. And so this garden was the first time I put a list of plants together, got the numbers together, went out and just laid the plants out all in one go. And, um, and they, uh, the layers came through that I was planning for some things worked, some things didn't. Other things showed me what they wanted to do like that digitalis ferruginea found its own niche by moving around into the driest places. So it was a fantastic learning opportunity that Francis gave me. Um, and in tandem with those 14 years, which took me into my early thirties, I was starting to develop my business. And I did a garden at the Chelsea Flower Show one year. Um, and this lady came and leaned over the uh, the edge of the garden and said in a very thick Italian accent, which I shan't try and reproduce, um, you must come and see my garden. I've got, this, I've got this opportunity, I've got this garden that I think that you would be really interested in coming to see. And I thought, well, that, what a lovely offer. You know, I'll probably never see her again. Um, but then the next day she came back, which was most unusual at the, at the show because people are passing through. And she said, no, I'm serious. And the following weekend, a... Um, an envelope arrived with two tickets in, it fell onto the floor uh, through the letterbox saying, come the next weekend. And I went and met her at Rome airport, not really knowing very much about her and um, with her husband, Carlo. And she was a woman called Violante Visconti. So she was the niece of the filmmaker and had had the most extraordinary life. 
um, and she was a lady of, uh, perhaps she was a lady of excesses, but she was a, she was a bohemian and she was a, um, I, in excess I mean she was a, um, she enjoyed life to the absolute max. And um, her and Carlo, who were not married at that time, they'd been together for many, many years. He lived in uh, Rome and she lived in Milan and together they would come to uh, various properties which they owned around the country and, and build gardens together. And Carlo had had a friend who was in financial difficulties and he'd bought this medieval village on a volcanic plug and said, look, I can't afford to keep it. And Carlo had said, well, I'll buy it from you, then I'll resell it to get him out of trouble. And one day Violanta and Carlo went down to see it and found this extraordinary place and thought, well, we can't possibly leave it. Um, and, and that's where I came in. She'd already started clearing it and the derelict uh, ruins were stabilized and they stopped the walls falling down. They'd been inspired by a wonderful garden called Ninfa. I don't know if anybody knows it in the audience, but it's a romantic garden in Southern Italy, not so far from this. And um, when I met Vilanta in the car, she gave me the brief on the way down. She said, look, we're in our mid sixties. I want to make this garden quickly. Um, these are the things I'm interested in. I want the garden to feel like it's been, uh, it's on the verge of being taken over by nature. I don't want it to be formal in any way, which is why I'm asking an Englishman to do it. And we drove down, we hurtled down the motorway. I was talking to Patrick about scary Italian driving far too fast with Violanta smoke chain smoking and the windows wound up with the aircon on and we were in this blue cube of smoke hurtling south with her turning around and telling me the brief and me just thinking okay well I wonder if we're going to get there and it got dark and I at some point fell asleep and then the next thing I knew we were bumping down a track and the track went on and on and on and I got out and opened a series of gates through these fields full of longhorn cattle and eventually we drove into this mysterious wood and up a hill and stopped in a little farmhouse. And the next morning she took me up to see this extraordinary place above it on this volcanic plug. And, um, whoops. And um, she said, I want this garden to be green and white. So I want this to be a cool place. I want it to be somewhere that is not like Southern Italy. And we um, started making a garden that uh, reflected that brief. Um, and we imported some big plants, which I'd never used before. So I was going to nurseries with her and choosing big pomegranates and camphor trees and things that would act fast. And what I didn't know it was that she'd been previously diagnosed with cancer and six years later, it caught up with her, but not before we uh, really got the bones of this garden in place. And, and this is the garden 25 years later, oops. Um, the ruins were festooned with uh, Rosa Madame of Carrier. Uh, we used these dark columns of cypress to introduce, reintroduce some structure. Um, plants that were adapted to that Mediterranean environment. Plants that were ultimately uh, allowed to scale the walls and then find their own level rather than over prune them. And um, in a way I realized what I was doing when I was making it was I was recreating that garden that had overtaken Miss Joy. So I was sort of in my element. And Carlo kept uh, going with the garden um, for several more years. So I continued to go out and once a year work with a young gardener called Stuart Barfoot, who then uh, started to develop the garden. Um, and I'd go out once a year and work on that with him. So the garden had this long life where I was actually contributing to it. Um, and gardens are places that do have long lives. They are something that are extremely fragile and fugitive. They are only as good as the input and the particularities of the owner or the person that's driving the energy behind them. And Carlo allowed this place to reign and to be a special place while it was developing. So, you know, now there's a Davidia tree, which you can see there, which was planted early on, now in full flower, the handkerchief tree on the right there. Um, just found its niche. There's a, a gardener there uh, called Angelo who's been there from the very beginning. Um, and the garden is now in the hands of the sun and uh, another Carlo Caracciolo. Um, and we're just about, we've just got funding to go back and, and develop 
uh, final part of it. So I'm going back in maybe 30 years later um, at some point to, to look an at an extension to the garden. So gardens are about a dialogue, they're about a dream, they're about finding a niche, they're about doing what's right for a place, they're about pushing boundaries. Um, and all of this, of course, is made more possible if you understand uh, how to tune into a sense of place and not to override it. Um, so I learned, I've been learning on the job, as it were, and places like that really have taught me an enormous amount. So this is one of the chapels in the property that we put this simple reflecting basin in to cool that open room down. Um, we just surrounded it with lemons and and then self-seeding things like poppies and larkspur in, in, in the ground around the basin. So often very simple, simple moves that just allowed a place to sing at a particular point. And we moved those occasions around the site through doing things large, like you might see a field full of poppies all flowering at the same time, or um, a hillside blooming with cherries. Um, we wanted there to be this feeling of transcendence that was, you were taken somewhere by a big movement in the garden. So here you can just see Viburnum tomatosum wrapping itself around that lawn and a big arbor close to the house of Wisteria, a formal move. Um, so you get these sort of happenings happen, happening, which are exciting. So I've made it a point, I now run a studio of 12 of us um, to be working on a range of things that vary from small, uh, domestic projects, uh, large domestic projects, small public projects, large public projects. So it stretches our mind, it's like an exercise. Um, often the private projects allow you to go perhaps deeper than you might be able to go in the reality of working in a public arena. Um, but you can take something of that learning through into the public arena and then convince the people that you're working with in the public arena to be pushing the horticulture, pushing the maintenance, pushing the boundaries of what they think might be possible for that place. So we're always very selective about what we choose. Um, and as I say, sometimes the projects, they don't have to be big things. So the Garden Museum is a garden in Lambeth, near Lambeth Palace, um, or attached to Lambeth Palace, um, where we've just made a, a garden which is uh, enwrapped by a new extension to the building, um, which is a place of learning, um, a restaurant on one side, teaching rooms on the other, a lecture room, and then a garden which has become a cornucopia of treasures because the great plant collector Tradiscant and his son are both buried in this courtyard. So we worked around the tombs and imagined that if they'd carried on collecting, these might be some of the things that they had grow, had in their pockets when they came back. Um, so the garden becomes this almost like a Wardian case, you know, the cases that they used to take overseas to bring things back um, in these little sheltered environments on the ships. And uh, there are things juxtaposed, each plant with a different story. So it becomes this fantastic teaching, teaching tool and also a wonderful backdrop um, to the building and the environment. And, and there's a very busy road running outside. Uh, there's often a, often a bustle of school kids moving through or teaching classes going on, but somehow this center of gravity that the garden gives the place is a, a moment of calm and reflection. Um, so it's a special place that looks at um, really pushing horticulture using that microclimate of uh, the center of London um, and the uh, the brief that this could be somewhere where people should feel like they've touched down in horticulture. I was asked to do a reimagining of Delos at Sissinghurst um, in the last few years. I've been working with Troy Scott Smith. Um, we call it, we joke about it really, but it's a godparenting role. And it's a role in which I've been going there for the last sort of six or seven years. Uh, once a year, twice a year at different seasons, just to work, workshop the garden with, with Troy, not to um, have to give any more than uh, best advice or, or comment on thoughts that he was having. And uh, we were doing this, looking around the garden, talking through his manifesto, which is ultimately to relax the garden and take it back to the garden that Vita and Harold 
had imagined it would be rather than the National Trust version that it ended up and became. Um, and it's really been interesting to be working on that to science or to try and unpick all these different layers that have superseded Harold and Vita and decide which ones to go back to. And one of the areas that we always struggled with was the Garden of Delos, which was a garden that was made by Harold and Vita. Um, this is the garden two years after it was installed actually, but the original garden, um, which was made um, in, or made as a result of a trip they made in 1935 to Delos, the island of Delos in Greece, um, was inspired by this romantic notion of bringing something of the ancients back to Sissinghurst and conjuring a place that was alien to Sissinghurst and making one of the garden rooms that step around the tower in the middle into somewhere that would be transporting and take you into a world of gods and uh, histories and um, stories. And uh, Harold had a collection of uh, altars. You can see one there on that left image, which were now highly illegally brought back to the UK. And they were the, the beginnings really of what this garden became. And then they used pieces of rubble and pieces of the old buildings which had come down at Sissinghurst to make and conjure the old streets of Delos. But they put it on the north side of a tall wall facing north, sloping north on thick, heavy wheeled and clay in Kent. And the garden failed and um, the plants that they put in, which you can see on the left were, that's, that's the garden in 1942, just before the war, of course, Sissinghurst was affected by um, the gardeners having to go off to war and it being run on a skeleton team. And uh, the garden declined and fell away. And over the years, it became a woodland garden with half of it put down to grass. You can see that central path from both photographs. And when I took the garden on to look at how we might redesign it, that's what it looked like with a woodland garden planted on one side, which was the natural thing to have on a north facing slope. Um, a piece of grass because they'd sort of run out of steam with what to do next. And everybody knew it was wrong, but nobody was quite brave enough to say, okay, let's do it. And that's what Troy did. He convinced the National Trust, good for him, to change it, to employ us at Dan Pierce's studio to uh, reimagine it. So we went back into the old photographs. We went back into the information which Harold and Vita had um, put down, mostly photographs, a couple of letters between them, not much information. Um, but one of the letters which uh, Vida had written was to say that she felt the garden hadn't worked and perhaps they could do better. So we saw this as being an opportunity to do exactly that. So we put in a new framework and um, I looked at the old photographs of Delos and uh, the city in ruins and then the uh, the the agricultural terraces that ran away from the city and up, up onto the slopes. And I've been going back to Greece many, many, for many years. I, I love the country. So I kind of know and understand that landscape quite well. So we imagined that that central meridian that was still there would be the main street in the, uh, in the town, as it were. And then we stepped these, uh, these old uh, layers of buildings we imagined they would be to echo Vita and Harold's and then we created a series of uh, more rustic rural terraces, which allowed us to bring the level up and batter the land back so that it faced south um, instead of facing north. We just brought it up and allowed us to create a soil depth of free draining soil, which was 30% uh, soils and 70% uh, gravels to create a free draining medium in which we then planted uh, a new palette of plants which are just beginning to settle in. I went off to meet the wonderful uh, nurseryman Olivier Philippi in southern France who gave me best advice. He took me off for a walk on the mountainside to see what I was made of and uh, for us to have a walking and talking conversation. Um, and then we sat down late one night and went through his plant catalogue and pulled together a list of plants which were all things that occurred in Greece 
and also, of course, beyond in the Mediterranean basin. But every single thing that is in the garden is from Greece. And, um, and it's really interesting as an educational tool because, of course, now we're suffering these droughts. Um, this garden has not been watered since it went in. Uh, and it was finished just the week before the pandemic hit and we went into lockdowns. We had a quiet year without any visitors um, and just a skeleton team looking after it as it came back into life again. Um, and now the garden is, is settling in and starting to feel like somewhere. And it's interesting because people were really shocked by the change. You know, they didn't like the idea of Sissinghurst being um, shaken up um, about there being something new there, but gardens are often um, places that are spoiled if they're preserved in aspic. They need to move on. Things grow, things die, things regenerate. Um, you need to move with that. And if you can take an original idea and go with that flow without being, without overriding it, um, you can often um, create something or keep an idea going that, that, that can be lost if you try to force something to stay the way that it is. So this garden really is the beginning of a new era at Delos and it will become what it will be through the maintenance of the gardeners who are looking after it. And, we're trying to um, look at maintaining the things in a different way. So rather than the plants being pruned as they might be a Santa Lina, we're saying, okay, let's goat prune things and imagine that you're a goat nibbling this. So things are pinched out in a very erratic way often. So you get this sort of layering in the plants. We're taking out some of the plants that were put in there at the beginning all in one go and getting new generations and cuttings. So things are of a different, different generations so there's mother colonies, youngsters coming alongside. So we get this feeling of it being a natural environment. And all this has come out of really that time I spent looking at plants in the wild and then thinking about how those environments work and then being given opportunities to reinterpret them. So this place I should keep moving because there's lots I want to share, um, is starting to come to life again. And it, it, it's a very exciting opportunity to do something like that in a, in, in a public arena where um, you know, you, the National Trust have, have been really brave here because they've, they've done something quite groundbreaking because most of their places are about preserving something. And, but they saw that this place had been lost to a point where actually it needed to be reimagined. Um, I'm just going to show you how I, I'm working overseas. I am working in, in the States, both on the East and the West Coast, but moderately and more so post-pandemic, we're trying to curb the amount of travel that we're doing and work with people that we are feel we have a synergy with and that we can make some positive change with in terms of environment. And environment has become more and more important to us and how we preserve our environments and look after them and nurture them through intelligent applications of horticulture and nurturing landscapes. You know, we are in this pos position of agencies as landscape, as we have this position of agency as landscape designers to make positive change. And some of the things we're working on now are at scale and allowing us to do that really and feel good about the moves that we're making, not being too dominant and not being um, inappropriate. And this is a property in uh, the ice box of Connecticut uh, Norfolk, Connecticut, and my client Susan Sheehan, who's a wonderful person, um, wrote to me uh, and I invited her to the studio so that we could meet each other to see whether we were going to be able to get this long-term connection. And she sent me, she's an art dealer, and she sent me a, a brief that was a 240-page document which was like Ways of Seeing, the book Ways of Seeing, which was one in image that she liked following another. Um, and about five Im images in, like there was a, a drawing by Richard Serra, and then there was a constable, and then there was, you know, when she went in the, the fourth, fifth, there was Monk's scream. And under it, she'd put, and this is how I feel about my current situation. Because she'd bought this house in a wood in the middle of the, the winter, and it was all under snow and sleeping. And then in the first summer, she's from New York, the whole thing started to grow in every single direction. She said to me when I got there, believe me, and I, this is the absolute truth, and we were standing on the front doorstep, 
out there is a world of terror. Um, how can you help me? And I'd gone back to her brief and on the last page, because some of the pictures were captioned, there was a blank page and the words, and I don't think I want a garden. So it was a really interesting situation to find ourselves in. And there was the remains of an old garden there underneath um, uh, a considerable amount of forest growth. Um, we pushed the forest growth back. I went out and spent a, a week with a really good team of Arbor guys and said, look, okay, let's look at this frontier of foliage here and we'll, we'll break into it. And so that we get these glades opening up and I gave them enough um, uh, of a steer in that week to then be able to continue and under the guidance of the master plan we put together for the site look at creating a series of glades and frayed edges to the woodland so that there wasn't a hard stop between the open places that were controlled by us and the places that had the reign of nature and uh, this fray and the meeting points of these uh, controlled and less controlled spaces of course become really interesting and, and one of the images that she'd sent to me was of John Muir sitting on a rock, an erratic, and she said one day I want to feel like this and and she sent me recently a picture of her on one of her erratics in the garden doing a John Muir pose um, because now they found a way of getting into the landscape which is really to um, create a series of places that are subservient to what's going on, but control where we need to. I was very interested to go today to the garden, to the Abbey Garden this morning and see these beautiful moss landscapes um, and how peaceful and restful they are. Um, and there is a moss landscape here on the drive, which we just simply paired back to the ferns at the edge and then introduced Cornus and Cercidophyllum and Cyadopites, the umbrella pine and things like that that fell right in the woods. And then just used the tall canopies of the sugar maples and um, the things that were already there as, as the bones. And then I made a series of interventions in the landscape that allowed us to move through a series of walks which connected happenings in the landscape. So uh, the, the house has got this long enfilade of rooms uh, with doors that you can open, see right the way from one room to the other. So at one end, the, the western facing end, we've created this long table, which is sort of almost the length of these chairs through here with a, a local stonemason that refers to these stone clearances, those walls that were made by the previous settlers that run through the woods. Um, and it's this diminishing line that starts wider at one end and narrow at the other. You can sit on it, you can go and have lunch on it. It becomes an object like a Richard Long or something in the landscape that allows you this engagement or sense of focus. And if you follow the line, it leads to a trail that darts between two erratics and you find yourself in the woods and on the beginning of a journey. And you go through the woods and then there might be something else like a, this cairn that we created that's now been planted by a, a, a large cushion of um, epimediums which just surround it in, in the woods. So there are these moments that uh, will be uh, just as good in snow as they will uh, in, uh, in early spring when the foliage is green or in the fall when it's orange or in summer when it's dappled. But there are places that you can go to that allow you to touch down for a moment in a place and feel the atmosphere there. So this cairn, for instance, is on the edge of the meadow, which I showed you at the beginning, and it's this meeting point between shade and light. Um, and it's all about that uh, transition from going from dark to light. Um, and then we made a, um, a, 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 a cutting garden, which is the only moment of true horticulture there, which is a D-shaped, old D-shaped garden with this old low wall around it and a straight wall on one side. Um, and then we created a garden in there, which is full of plants, which you can pick for the house. And Susan's got impeccable taste. So we didn't have to fill it with things that were kind of gaudy. We filled it with things that felt right within that woodland setting. Um, back to another um, project up in, uh, in, in Northern England. Um, Lau the Castle was a project I was asked to work on in 2008 um, and it is a, um, a property which uh, has a 140 acre original formal garden um, 
which the, the current custodian, Jim Lowther, who's my age, had been given the property by his dad, um, who in turn, the, uh, their predecessors go back over a thousand years on the same land. And his dad had come back after the war and been very disillusioned, um, come back a complete socialist. He didn't want any of the wealth from his previous, uh, um, his, his grandparents and his great grandparents. He didn't want any of the bills either. Um, so he ruinized the castle, sold most of the contents, um, took the roof off, avoided death duties, which were coming up, um, and put a battery chicken farm over the lawns and allowed army tanks to use the formal gardens as a test ground for a new weapon. Um, so Jim's dad did this incredible kind of act of vandalism, really. And Jim was then left with this white elephant, serious white elephant, with a castle that was falling down and perilously dangerous, um, with an old garden that had been overplanted with Sitka spruce. His dad was a forester. Um, so underneath here, there's this formal garden that um, is literally just been overplanted. The lawns were, as you see here, the, uh, the battery chicken farms here and uh, just terrible situation really. And Jim said, what do you think I sh you should do? And I said, well, this is so exciting. Um, <laughs> this is a garden that makes me feel like a child again. You know, we're walking through the woods and uh, suddenly you'd find this old pond that was semi full with water and dead trees falling into it. And I said, why don't we let the people who are going to come to this place, because he wanted to open it to the public and it, he couldn't because it was dangerous. Why don't we make them feel like they're part of this sense of discovery? So we put a master plan together to um, identify um, about 15 to 18, um, we called them hotspots or moments where we felt we could make gentle interventions over perhaps 30 years to unwrap a number of moments within this ancient landscape that would allow us to bring the people who are coming to look at the garden along with us in terms of the process of making this garden live again. And the first thing that we did um, was to, Jim went out and worked with another landscape architect called Dominic Cole, to, who's a his, historic landscape architect. And he re, um, reconditioned the lawns, removed the uh, chicken sheds, put them back to their old configuration. It's a very complicated site because it sort of rolls down to the river uh, Eden at the bottom. Um, and there's high ground and the lake's just over the, over the rise. So everything's on sort of curious angles and he made all that work and the walls were stabilized. And once they were stabilized, Jim asked me back to start to work on these hotspots. And one of the first areas that we made was um, a courtyard in the right um, where we used very simple moves of uh, imagining that these big elements of the castle were brought down in vegetation uh, into the old stable yards as a welcoming place for um, people once they came into the site. Bearing in mind this is all austere and grey and it needs vegetation. Um, this was just seemed like a very simple move. And then we moved um, out to the front of the castle and there was previously a another castle on the spot where we made what we call the tapestry garden. And I wanted to acknowledge the fact there'd been another building here. So the hedges in the garden feel like they might be the old walls of the previous castle. Um, but the site is so big, everything is of such an enormous scale that we needed to ground the castle to stop it being so austere. It's gray, it's ruinous. Um, it's something that doesn't necessarily make you feel particularly comfortable. So we need something there at scale to allow you a way into that environment. And we reuse some of the pieces that have fallen off the building as seats and uh, places to be, and made a series of pathways through this flower parterre, which we also described as being a threadbare carpet. Um, so it looked like a warp and a weft had woven away, worn away in certain places where the paths were, and then the planting was still the textile that was left between the warp and the weft. And there it is looking back onto the lawns and the old shrub borders, which were there once in the old days are now made into wildflower meadows on either side. Um, and then we started to plant up uh, the ruins 
um, imagining that these were the, uh, the old great halls, for instance, where there were paintings and treasures on the walls, that actually the treasures in the house were now the plants. So this being a public garden, you know, we have a, a, a private owner here. Um, and although money is not, it has to be very carefully spent, which is why there's this long unraveling process um, of, uh, of reopening the garden through the projects. Um, we wanted it to be really special for it to be a center of horticultural excellence. So that all the planting within the castle is of very particular things. So we used a black stemmed birch, for instance, to uh, enhance this or up this slightly melancholy mood of this ruin. Um, and then blue mechanopsis, which thrive in that area to punch the light and the life into the place and festoon the walls, uh, no less with a kibia. I've got 10 minutes, hope I've got way, way too many slides. Um, thank you, Patrick. May I have 15? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll keep going. Please tell me when you start to fall asleep. I, I, I won't exceed 15. Um, and then we made a, a rose garden on the site of the old rose garden um, that uh, looked at the design of a quartered rose. So if you imagine you look down on a rose and the petals uh, were then drawn as the beds and the outside petals of the rose were eglantine rose, rose of rose, Rosa rubiginosa or eglantaria, which is this, has this wonderful perfume of apples. And that stops you seeing into the center petals of the rose, which is where the color is, which is where the David Austin roses are. So it's a moment of horticultural, a high horticultural moment that's then punched into this woodland to provide people with this focal point of interest. And everybody loves a rose garden, or most people do. People that don't like uh, higher horticulture, as I call it, the specialist plants within the castle ruins would find somewhere that something that they would be interested in here. So it's about trying to please people um, and give a range of people different things to look at. So we're now looking at restoring the old uh, rock garden, the old sweet scented garden, the old Japanese garden using the old frameworks, planting the sweet scented garden exclusively with sweet scented things for a woodland, katsura trees, um, sweet woodruff, uh, valerians, um, hamamelis, sweet scented magnolias, etc planting in the Japanese garden uh, purely with Japanese plants, rather than thinking that we should make Japanese bridges and, um, and going the whole hog. We're just playing with that idea. We're installing two new little pavilions in there that are made from the local wood by the local woodworker. And then the rock garden is planted with a cornucopia of um, treasures that survive in that uh, very damp Northumbrian climate. So things which are very particular to that place. And Jim has gone on, inspired Jim Lowther by the success with the garden to start to rewild the 7,000 acres estate beyond the formal gardens. He started first with the 3,000 acre deer park and now he's going on to the whole site. He's worked out a very clever way of making it um, pay through selling carbon credit. Um, so it's completely viable. It's more viable than the farming that was happening on the land. It's about uh, regenerative agriculture meeting um, rewilding and biodiversity gain, um, enormous biodiversity gain. He's now got five other landowners and they're hoping to connect uh, these five big estates, which are huge, with these little tenuous connection points to make these big rewilding opportunities happen. And that's what I mean by this agency. It's not directly me, but um, I'm in this world that is now really thinking big in terms of how can we protect our environment and do it on a big scale. And with people like Jim Lowther at the helm and responsible thinking, um, I do believe that we're gonna start really being able to make a difference. The first project that I worked on was the, on that front was to, to catch a Millennium Forest in, in Hokkaido. Um, and a newspaper magnet had acquired the forest in the late 90s with the view of making his newspaper business carbon neutral. And I was asked to see the project by a landscape architect called Takano, who sadly now died about two years ago. 
And we'd met in Tokyo many years ago and Takano had, had done the big master plan for the site as an ecological park. Um, and they had come up with this idea that it would be sustainable for a thousand years, which is some kind of crazy rhetoric. Um, but it does get you thinking, doesn't it? Because what does that mean? And we took it to mean when he asked me to make a, a garden master plan, a, a, a garden master plan layer within his garden, within his um, ecological park master plan. Um, we wanted that to be all about how do you get people to touch down in a space? How do you get them to engage with nature? How do you get them to stay there? How do you make them feel safe in a big environment? This is 4,000 hectares where there are bears in the woods, um, where they're very, uh, you know, Japan is a very urban centric place. And this is extremely wild. There are, when there's a typhoon, the mountainside gets washed away. You know, it's, 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 it's an extraordinary place. So we made a garden master plan and then picked off a number of different environments that would help to ground people and to make them feel part of the environment. And one of the first that we did was to create um, a landform, borrowing the idea of uh, sheke, the borrowed, borrowed view from the Japanese culture, um, but reinterpreting it. And what I'd found through going to Japan was that gardens often didn't actually connect with nature they reinterpreted it either through literature or or painting um, those were the, the the disciplines they went to to study to um to to study garden design those were the things that were their their their, their feed um, and i wanted people to connect directly so i wanted to get people out into the landscape so we made this land form on a five hectare pasture field which was a clearance that had been made and one of Mr Hayashi Arakayan's big moves was to try and stop the clearances from agriculture try and stop the clearances from forestry and arrest this place in terms of its uh its its overdevelopment by agriculture and forestry and then regenerate it in a positive way so this move was to get people to think about that to reconnect with the landscape and this landform was alongside a restaurant which was previously on this flat field and I went there with Takano and people would go to the restaurant, go out onto the terrace at the front and then retreat and go back through the wood to their coach. And I said, well, how can we get people further on? So I made the landform and what was brilliant about and unexpected was that these waves which are conjuring that distant horizon, so I drew all these, these horizon lines and then reinterpreted them closer up to make these foothills, imaginary foothills, was that kids would run out up these slopes and then disappear down a 15 foot drop, a steep slope on the other side and their parents would get up out of the chairs and follow them. <laughs> and then you'd see them on the next rise and next time you saw them, they were having fun and they'd be rolling down the next slope altogether. And then slowly you'd see them out on the edge, right on the edge, and then they'd disappear into the landscape and they were off. You know, you'd got them out there and you'd got them with their feet a bit muddy perhaps. I hope they hadn't met a bear. But uh, you got them out connecting with landscape. So we made another piece, which was a big move to um, uh, reconnect people with nature by looking at the natural ground floor, the flora in the wood, and combining what was happening there in terms of that ecosystem with um, imported plants so that people would see native plants alongside western style plants that they would recognize in the garden and therefore not overlook their native plants which were right underneath their foot because they saw them juxtaposed. So I made a similar space, another five hectares, um, into the meadow garden and this is my plan looking at, I think we had 18 zones with uh, different mixes in each zone that also connected to the mix next door that were separated by these big grass hedges, which was an ornamental grass called calf festival, which allowed me to change the tone and mood between each of these areas. And then we imagined that this glade that we'd made, which is an uber glade, an uber, an uber meadow, um, was something that you might find in the middle of this wood, but it was heightened. It was almost a kind of, not by Disney at all, but it would be where you'd find things coming together that you might have never have seen before. So there'd be something um, that you'd see in the woods like a trillium right along something that you'd only see in a garden that was ornamental. Um, but choosing things which felt right together um, and worked well together because they were from some sim similar 
um, zones in the world where those things occurred naturally. There's this wonderful crossover between North America and Russia and North and Japan, for instance. So we could start to get those synergy between things because we knew they all grew in similar conditions. And I created a series of uh, color fields that you moved through at scale um, with this one large sweep of path through the middle, which was made from the large, which was felled from the woods to allow regeneration of natural vegetation. Um, and so we reused that and then created a, a number of these, these palettes really, which change and morph throughout the course of the year, course of the growing season. And the growing season are very compressed there because it snows, uh, the snow doesn't melt, melt into the middle of April and it comes in at the, the beginning of October. They're down to minus 25 degrees for six months or down to that over a course of six months. And Midori would send me these wonderful um, little haikus of what was happening in the garden. And um, one day she sent me, she said that, you know, people are screaming in the garden today, um, which you know, made me alarmed at the beginning of her little haiku. Um, but it was because there'd been this proliferation of swallowtail butterflies which had come together because we put all these plants together which had come, uh, so there were Japanese plants who were attracting the Japanese native insects with plants which did, with, with high pollen uh, quotient that were foreign and they were all coming together in a compressed season um, and the insects were kind of en masse so you walk through the garden there'd be these flurries of hundreds and hundreds of butterflies which were making people incredibly excited um so this garden has really generated this wonderful sort of energy and uh midori the head gardener there who looks after it you can see her here is the most wonderful incredibly special person who has devoted her life to this garden she looks after it with a very skeleton team uh, a terrific guy called um, Shintaro who works alongside her and a very small team sometimes interns um, uh, during the summer and they uh, they look after this garden absolutely beautifully and it's an evolving thing um, I deliberately planted it in this very random way within those mixes so that there'd be a natural evolution in the plants and in a normal year I would go back once a year at different times in the season and Midori and I would workshop the garden together and um, keep it moving in the right direction. So places like that are really incredibly exciting for getting people to think and re-engage with nature in a different way. Um, and then gardens, of course, have different functions. Dartington in, uh, in Devon, which is a project that I was asked to do a master plan for, has this wonderful crossover with here, of course, um, with uh, the philanthropists that took it on in the 1920s, the Elmhursts, and they made this a center of learning, of uh, original thinking. Um, there was a school with progressive teaching there. There was a tweed mill, Bernard Leach pottery. Um, they looked at progressive means of um, changing forestry and agriculture. Um, and of course, they invited Beatrix Farrens to uh, help them make sense of the garden. And she went there only four times, um, but she helped to put a plan together that is still there in places. Um, this is the main courtyard where you can see, now I'm understanding more for seeing what I've seen actually in the flesh here today. Her, um, interest, for instance, in closing the walls. Um, she made this very beautiful court. It's very, very simple, um, only making the moves where she needed to, um, looking very carefully at form and the use of trees and shrubs and the juxtaposition of the buildings to the landscape. And it was very, very interesting to go into not only her lair, but what had come and failed and then become incredibly overgrown. And we are in the process now of raising funds for the master plan to regenerate Dartington and to make it into a place of excellence again. And for the garden, which is of a certain age to have this new chapter. And next year they're having a, an exhibition on Beatrix Farrand in May. Um, I, I, 
please feel free to come, um, which is starting this kickstart really to get the master plan financed to make this place sing in the way that it once did. So an incredibly exciting range of different things that all stem from this uh, beginning in horticulture and this love of landscape and this desire to uh, be in touch with it. And I keep this going for myself with just these last five slides, don't panic, um, of my place in Somerset where I have 20 acres, where I have about probably two acres, um, an acre under cultivation, another acre under very relaxed, uh, gentle interventions into the natural landscape. And then the remaining space is uh, being managed for meadow and woodland and biodiversity gain. And it's a place that allows me to have my think tank to experiment, to make my successes and make my failures and to revise what I thought I knew and have to relearn um, and continue that process of learning. It's my living portfolio. It's where I can bring my clients to show them what I do. It's where I'm engaging with landscape and all the things that I believe are important to it. Um, and where I every day pinch myself and say thank you for finding this thing so early in life and being able to make it into something which I enjoy deeply and I'm now able to um, share with others in many different ways. So thank you very much for asking me here um, and taking part um, and indeed for, uh, for giving me this opportunity. So thank you, thank you. Uh, so, Dan, I'd like to uh, present to you, a great privilege to present to you, the Beatrice Fair and Society Achievement Award. And I, I went with this, uh, thank you. It's gone. Anyway, <laughs> I can do without it. Uh, you're joining Lori Olin, Adam Greenspan, uh, Betsy Barlow Rogers, Pete Rudolph. Uh, in this, uh, you're now part of that uh, uh, an impressive and really kind of wonderful group of people. Uh, so, um, a key thing that actually is curiously relates to a conversation we had earlier and very much part of your talk. Um, is on the award, uh, can you, is it there, so can you, yeah, can you see it, there, okay. On the award, we have Intellectum by Mihai E. Vivum. okay, and that is on the lintel of Garland, uh, the doorway at Garland Farm, okay, and so it's something that, um, we're not sure exactly what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so because it could be Latin, it could be Vulgate, and it also could be biblical. So each one is a little different. Um, if you take the, if you just translate the Latin, it means give me understanding so that I can live. Okay, but if you then go on, if you take it to um, the, the Psalm where it is, uh, which is Psalm 118, um, it's actually much more meaningful to a gardener, I think, because what it, what it says is, give me the ability to understand and I shall live. And I think that's very much a, a part of gardening and what gardeners learn uh, as they, you know. So here you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, I, I'm humbled very much so, uh, and thank you for the translation. I'm going to get you to write, write both of them down for me, uh, because it's so true. Um, and the more you look, the more you learn. Uh, and we're all learning, aren't we, for this world being something that just continues to provide us with challenges and opportunities and uh, potentials. 
Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. I think there are questions and answers. Is that what? Yeah. Yes. Does anyone have a question? I, I probably exhausted everybody. The gentleman in the front. So, uh, Sorry. Asking, so, very I think it was I had too many slides. <laughs> so there is a there's a wireflower, there are wireflower panels to either side. Um, and they uh, start to become that loud is louder, they start to become uh, come to life in it's late there because it's north in April and they'll go right the way through to end of August and then they cut down and then they um, they are then little bulb fields which we're putting bulbs into to punch that life in for early in the season. And then, of course, the wildflowers are taken on beyond the garden with this rewilding now. Right. So um, a big exercise in there being uh, a sort of cross pollinization between the garden and the landscape. Yep. Is, the, is the council working as a, a, a place for the So the, 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 the garden is open to the public. Yep, very much so. And um, it's, it's, it's popular. It's good. Yeah. Patrick's signaling to me at the back. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I want to say I'm so impressed that you managed to talk the National Trust into taking out, I think so many of the National Trust properties are becoming sort of like local council roundabouts. And the fact that you managed to talk them into it, I find very impressive. I'm wondering whether you're finding an acceptance of your wilding style or whether that's still kind of a minority thing that you have to fight for all the time. Um, well, firstly, we have to thank Troy Scott Smith, the head gardener at Tissinghouse, uh, for that. Um, and going to your second part, I, just, I, I think there is a, there's a, uh, it's just catalytic now. It's, it's happening quite fast. Um, it was very interesting this year at the Chelsea Flower Show that the garden that got best in show was a rewilding garden. Um, and I think that suggests that, I don't think it was the best garden um necessarily but it was really interesting that uh they felt it was it was important um and there have been gardens that have been wild at chelsea for many years um but now they've really you know things are catching up and there is an, an acceptance for sure and i think that is entirely good i think we are at the we're at this really important crunch point aren't we where we're having to act now we we haven't even got time to think we're just having to act in terms of things being improved with our relationship and towards nature and and this is a way in you know gardens are a way into that and the the interest in biodiversity and nature and our connection through horticulture to nature is it's just totally natural logical next step so i think uh, i think we're seeing more of it for sure yeah we have a couple of questions from our Zoom audience. The first one is, how much are you influenced by wildlife ecosystems or are your gardens more about pleasing the human aesthetic? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I will always or prefer to go into landscape to see what's happening there when I go to a new site. Uh, and there you get to understand what's really going on. And if you can start by teaching yourself about the local ecologies, um, you can then find a way of tuning into what is right in the place and the aesthetic follows that. So it's, it's, just, it's a natural, it's a, it's a conversation you're having with the land um, and the aesthetic comes out of that. So I think that I find that if you are creating something that feels in balance and in tune. It is not necessarily to everybody's taste, but I think people feel 
better in a place that's in tune and in balance. And the wildness in my gardens, I think, isn't, um, isn't always confronting to people. They feel like they can recalibrate there. And the aesthetic of that is important to me in a way as well. It's just as important as it is the fact that it actually functions and works and is right for the place. So the two are completely hand in hand, actually. And I, I think uh, a beautiful place is somewhere that works. And somewhere that works is somewhere that's appropriate and sits well and properly in its landscape and puts something back. Okay. And um, as you talk about rewilding, could you please define wild? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> wild. Um, there are very few places in the UK that are truly wild, which is why I've had this fascination in primitive landscapes. And when you find a primitive landscape, the first that I really found were in the South Island of New Zealand. Um, there's something extraordinary about that layering of time and adaptation that happens in a landscape that hasn't been altered by man. There's something just as interesting in a landscape that has been altered by man and nature then takes it back. Um, and I think that wild for me might be the word somehow might be about that taking back. Um, it's not necessarily about the balanced place, the primitive place. It, it's about the place that's actually taken control again. It's nature having got the upper hand somehow or reasserted itself. Um, but I think it's, wild is, now I think it's great that it's a word that's easily accepted in gardens. Um, and it's been going on for quite a long time. If you think about uh, William Robinson, his, his wild gardens. Um, and you know, what we've seen today in the Abbey Garden, you know, so much of that environment is actually a place which is, is almost just nature. And then it's just us tweaking it and allowing our way in to make ourselves feel comfortable there through managing gently. Um, but the juxtaposition of the two is really essential. Otherwise you wouldn't have that wonderful free song that you have when the two come together. Long answer, sorry. Big Thank question. you for that. Thank you, good question. And one more question from Zoom. Curious about the smallest scale project you have ever worked on. Naturalizing a small space like my half acre is daunting. I think it's all about the layering. You know, even if you've just got a half acre, there's an opportunity in there for it to work on many layers and for it to be from the soil up something you've considered so what's going on underneath the soil and in the soil is just as important as what the soil supports and that's your rich resource um, your habitat your environment is the next thing that is rich and if you've got nothing you then have to create something that is as layered as a natural environment can be. And if you look at a natural environment, there's always, um, there are always these uh, layers that transcend each other over the course of a growing season or coexist, where niches are found between things and balances are found between things. And it doesn't have to happen on a big scale. You know, we make small London gardens, which have got many layers of things from bulbs that disappear and go to the ground covers that knit and protect the soil, to emergence which rise above them, and then shrubs, and then trees, and then climbers in the trees, and then sky. And you've got all those interactions of things that allow a garden to be dynamic. Um, it's not about space, it's about, I think, how you look at finding this, tuning this balance between things where they're not competing with each other so that you can get the diversity in. Um, so it's not always about scale. It's good to understand scale in the first place, but it's, it's important to think that, remember that you can actually modify that to work smaller. Half acre, I would say, was good. <laughs> the gentleman here on the left, and then we have a lady here on the right, my right. There we go. There we go. Um, yeah, I'm thinking that as I look at what you've done and where you are, uh, in the past, garden, the properties have been very structured, and very formal. And you're going back to make them less so 
and and where they were there were not much was going on now there's a great deal happening in the garden you're creating and my question is where do you see in the continuum of garden development where are we now and where are we headed um i think it's an extremely good question um i think there is a call of the wild happening um and i just went to a garden two days ago uh owned by a man called James Gold, and it's called In, In Federal Twist. And he's just brought a book about it, out about it. And it's um, a conversation that he's having with a glade that he is occupied with plants and thoughts about how those plants coexist with each other. And it's deeply informal. Um, it's about the natural rhythms of uh, nature in there. He's not fighting it. He's trying to find his way in with appropriate plant material. and using it in a very painterly and artistic way, actually, but it's about, all about trying to find the balance. And one of the things that's inspiring about that garden is that James says that if he is no longer there, the garden is very quickly going to be reclaimed by the wood. And there's something beautiful about that fugitive feeling of it. So I think that our, in a way, our, our, our hand can become lighter and lighter if we understand what imprint we're making. Um, if we're making a gentle imprint that works in a place, it's often much more sustainable than something that's imposed and forced. Um, so it's about trying to strike that balance. So I think gardens will become, uh, perhaps they will become lighter or even almost non-existent and often just be ways into natural places. Um, ways that will make you feel comfortable where you are, a seat by a tree with a view, somewhere that feels gently managed um, instead of overly managed with too many resources used on it. That's where I feel things are going. I mean, that's my natural preference, but I can't see that we can continue to pour enormous resources into, into landscapes when, um, when we need to be trying to make them heal. Um, so I think that's where it's going. I think that's where it's going. Is there one more here? Right behind you. In the process of rewilding, do you um, feel like there's maybe a movement towards not pulling everything out? For example, you have a field and you're just adding things in rather than completely removing, for example, for a meadow, just so you have more natural things that have just popped up and rather than just pulling it all out and starting from scratch. Oh, for sure. I think, um, yes, I think there's a lot more with meadows, for instance, um, we're now, uh, rather than starting from scratch, you know, our, our company's looking this, we say, let, let it grow for the first summer, let's see what's in there. And then how can we manage it back into what it, we, where we need it to be? So we might be over sowing a meadow, for instance, with another seed mix with something like yellow rattle, which is a semi-parasitic annual, which allows the window of opportunity for things to make their way into the sward. We might be putting di different cutting regimes in place, which will uh, maybe take a thuggish plant back and allow other things to come forward. So often it's just about management. It's not necessarily about, we would always err on the side of saying, don't break too many eggs to make the omelet, just see what is happening and then use your intelligence to manage it back in the right way. At Dartington, the Elmhurst did a lot of reconstruction to the hall itself. And I'm just curious, do the present day heritage organizations in the UK still regard those as favorable or um, do they see them in not so good a light, to, you know, based on what was done? In terms of, can you just... In terms of reconstructing the Great Hall and some of the various aspects of those buildings. I think um, every project different. I think what was interesting about um, Delos, for instance, was that there was nothing left uh, that worked. Um, if there had been things that were working, it might have been interesting just to, uh, I think the National Trust would have had a very different opinion. Um, with Lau the Castle, for instance, we've looked at the palimpsest and the layers 
and said, okay, which are the most important layers to help us tell the story? Um, and to not override a certain chapter or to key into a certain chapter. And that sudden sometimes means that you have to ignore other things that have happened or take away layers which have been added which aren't quite right. It's a very interesting process actually looking at that palimpsest and seeing what has the most value. And I think um, it, it's about the, it's often about the interpretation. It, it's how you need to tell the story. What do you need to show to tell the story with something that has a history? Um, so every project is different on that front. And I think there is probably a lighter and lighter touch now and less feeling that things need to be reconstructed, shown to you in a literal way. Um, because there are other ways of interpreting what it was once um, and to show what it has become and allow people their imagination in part to get you to that point is, is often a richer experience. But there are lots of different versions of, you know, how you engage with history like that. And um, I think the, the mo for myself, the most interesting ones are where you have to actually use your imagination to a point. And we find that that allows people their way in most successfully. The gentleman here with the two fingers. So this question is very pertinent. It's the question about uh, how uh, our approach to water. Um, we are now looking at um, really thinking extremely carefully about, we have done always, but now we're not able to not think about it. Um, we have to make sure that we're planting appropriately for the area we try and plant uh, only irrigate for establishment and then choose things which are going to be uh, appropriate for the rainfall or whatever rainfall we're going to get. Um, we're trying to talk to our clients about a garden having its natural cycles and if a lawn goes brown, it goes brown in the summer. It's not where you put your water, you put your water into the things that have got a longer life, the lawn will come back or not having a lawn at all. Um, we're really thinking very hard about that because it's going to become a, a bigger and bigger issue. And of course, we've also got that unknown with the counterpoint, which is what happens if we have too much water, because we're seeing these extremes, aren't we, where we have very high rainfall in the winter or in seasons where we didn't usually have it. The ground can't cope. Uh, and then we're having flooding. So it's, it's very extreme, the situations we're having to think about. And so we're we're kind of second guessing an unknown situation um, where we have been thinking in a more measured way, I guess, than the way we're having to think now. In California, for instance, we've just been told this year that the water use has gone down to, you're only allowed to use the water one day a week. Now it's like full stop. So the plans that we put in place for this particular garden seven years ago, uh, aren't going to be affected massively, but we're going to have to look at the size of material we're putting in. So we're putting in smaller plants that need less water to establish. Um, and that means measuring the client's expectations of what they're going to get on day one. So a lot of it's about negotiating with the people you're working with and measuring expectations. But it's definitely an important issue. We can't continue to water where we shouldn't be watering. No. Thank you, Dan. And because of time, we have one more closing comment um, that I'd like to share from Zoom. What a wonderful lifetime achievement. Congratulations on your award and thank you for sharing your evolution with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
there is a um, how much the question is just just in case people haven't heard uh, how much uh, of Beatrix Farron's influence at Dartington are we considering in terms of moving things uh, back towards her original thinking so there are certain areas which uh, I mean it's really interesting having been to see things in the flesh here now um, and just this last day sort of tuning in just a little bit into what she actually did here uh, there's a woodland garden there which is uh, a number of formal walks through a hillside which she that was her design uh, with groups of rhododendrons and trees and views between them so formal juxtaposing informality and it's got very locked in by too much growth so we're having to look at which layers in that planting are the most important ones which were the original rhododendrons which she's put in which are the seedling rhododendrons which might be sacrificial to get the views back etc so her thinking in terms of how that wanted to feel that hillside is definitely something we're thinking about in terms of the development but there are no planting plans it's just an intent um, so it's important to get into the spirit of that intent when you're looking at what happens next and what can happen with the resources that Dartington now have in terms of their man force, their labor. And what can we do that's appropriate to marry all those things together? Um, and there are other parts of the garden as well, which she had influence over, which are definitely going to be considered as part of the master plan. So it's, it's gentle moves often, um, but I think I can see now that her presence there was an important one. She gave some order to a garden which had arrived in many ways throughout there being an ad hoc approach to how things were planted. And Dorothy Elmhurst employed her to try and get some order into the model. And I think that's one of the things that we'll be trying to put back. Yeah. But thank you. Nice question to end with. Thank you.